Today, we are talking about media and boundary conditions, which we'll refer to as just BCs for short. The reason we're talking about this is that when we start to investigate a new coordinate system, one of the first things we will do is to assume that we are in free space, which has permeability mu zero and permittivity epsilon zero, and then solve Maxwell's equations. That little arrow there represents some solution of Maxwell's equations, E and H, defined throughout space and generally we will work in the phasor domain so there'll also be a function of frequency. Now things start to get more complicated if we introduce some material into our environment. And this material will be characterized by a permeability mu and a permittivity epsilon. And if at least one of these differs from the free space value, then we'll see because of the boundary conditions at the interface between this material and free space, we have to get new fields. So if we call these original fields here the incident fields, E sub i, H sub i, so this is the incident. Uh, let's call these the reflected fields, or we could call them the scattered fields. And then inside the object, we'll also get some fields we'll call the transmitted fields. And these will all arise because the only way we can satisfy the boundary conditions is to have these additional field components. And of course, these will be the interesting things for us to study. It will be the interaction of the electromagnetic field with different material, different media, in, uh, inside our domain of solution. So we need to be able to understand and have some, at least a simple model for permeability and the permittivity. So we'll start off with the uh, discussing the permittivity. So first of all, let's recall Gauss's law for the electric field. It is that the divergence of the electric flux density is equal to the charge density Q. And if we're in free space, that becomes epsilon zero times the divergence of the electric field, E, is equal to Q. That's the differential form. The integral form will be obtained by uh, integrating this over a volume. So to be explicit here, let's assume we have a charge Q. We're going to call this a free charge. And that is at the center of a sphere, not necessarily a physical sphere, but a mathematical sphere of radius R. So this sphere is going to form a surface, and the interior is going to be an enclosed volume. So we integrate this equation over that volume, and then on the left-hand side, we use the divergence theorem to convert that integral of the divergence into an integral of a flux through the surface. What we get is the integral form of Gauss's law. Epsilon zero times the integral over that closed surface of E dot ds is equal to the integral of the charge density inside, which of course is just the total charge enclosed inside the sphere. And by symmetry on this sphere, we can argue that the electric field must point radially outward from the center, and it must be have the same magnitude everywhere on that sphere. And therefore, this must read that epsilon zero times the area of the sphere, which is four pi r squared 
times the magnitude of the electric field must be equal to the enclosed charge, Q enclosed. And so we get that the electric field must be Q enclosed over 4 pi epsilon 0 r squared. And then it points in the unit vector direction a hat r, which points radially away from the charge. So that's just Coulomb's law, and we've talked about that previously, and you've covered this in your undergraduate uh, courses also. Now, imagine what happens if we put this charge, instead of in free space, we put it inside some material. So we've got this material here, and that material is made up of atoms. And each of those atoms will have a positively charged nucleus and a cloud of negatively charged electrons maybe formed into some crystal lattice structure like so now what happens if we put this free charge inside of that object well that's going to create an electric field and what is going to happen to these, and we're going to call these the bound charges. What happens to those bound charges? Well, the positive charges, the nuclei, want to go in the direction of the electric field, and the negative charges want to go in the opposite direction to the electric field. So they're going to tend to separate. For simplicity, let's assume that the positive nuclei stay put in the crystal lattice, maybe, and only the negative electron charges move. We'll get the same result regardless of what we assume, but it's just a little easier to sketch things out if we assume that. So what's going to happen? Well, these negative charges are going to tend to move towards the free charge. Now, going back to our sketch here in free space, if we have an atom out here where those bound charges separate, with the negative charge moving towards the free charge, does so something like this, they separate by a distance L. If they're both well outside the sphere at all times, well, it doesn't change the enclosed charge inside the sphere. Likewise, if we have two bound charges that are inside the sphere and they separate, that doesn't change the total charge enclosed by the sphere either, because you have plus, let's say, uh, this is plus QB, and this is minus QB. Well, QB minus QB is zero. There's zero net charge. If both of the charges remain inside the sphere, or both remain outside the sphere, you get no change in the enclosed charge. But now, if you had an atom that was close to the boundary, so that when these charges separated by a distance L, they were both originally outside the sphere, then we put this free charge here, that electric field drew this negative charge through the surface of the sphere, that would reduce the amount of enclosed charge inside the sphere. And we've got to take that into account, right? because nature doesn't care whether we call the charges free or bound or whatever. It's just the total net enclosed charge goes up here. And so if that changes, the electric field is going to change. And that's called the dielectric effect. Let's assume here's our, our free charge, Q, at the center of the sphere. This is the boundary of the sphere. And here we're going to have the nucleus and the electrons conceptually separated by a distance L. And this is going to cause negative charge to flow into the interior of the sphere, and it's going to decrease the total enclosed charge. Now, what will the distance L be? Well, there'll, there'll be some electric field here, E. And so the positive charge will feel a force away from the surface of the uh, sphere, F, in that direction. And the negative charge will feel a force drawing it into the sphere. So equal and opposite forces there. Let's call that negative F. And of course that will just be equal to the electric field times 
the charge, QB, and in this case, it would be the electric field times minus QB, and point in the opposite direction. The charges will separate until the force due to this separation offsets the force due to the electric field. So let's treat this as a spring with a spring constant K. So in equilibrium, the spring force K times L will be equal to the supplied force E times QB. And from that, we can solve that L is equal to E times QB over K. Now, suppose we have N bound charges per unit volume per cu cubic meter. And that's going to typically be, you know, trillions of trillions, so just almost uncountable number of bound charges. We want to know how many of these bound charges will cross the surface of the sphere. Well, the charge, charges will cross the surface of the sphere if this distance dis displacement L is larger than the distance from the positive charge to the sphere in the first place. In other words, here is our sphere of radius R. And let's imagine now a spherical shell about that, which has a width of L. All of the charges inside that spherical shell will have the negative parts cross over the surface of the sphere, where L is equal to this value, where E is the, is the electric field at the surface of the sphere. Okay, So charge that enters the sphere will be, well, we need to know how many, uh, how many charges there are in this volume. Well, what's the volume? Uh, a good estimate of the volume is that it is, for, for small values of L, it's the surface area of the sphere, 4 pi r squared, times the width of the shell, L. And so how much charge enters into the sphere? Well, each one of those will contribute minus QB, and then you, the total number is going to be 4 pi r squared L times the number of charges, bound charges, per cubic meter. So that's going to be minus QB 4, by, uh, 4 pi r squared uh, N. And L we're going to write up here as EQB over the spring constant K. And so finally, that will be equal to, we'll write it this way. Um, here you've got an N. You've got a QB squared, so minus N. QB squared, you've got an over K. And then you've got what's remaining is 4 pi R squared. And then the electric field E. So that'll be the total amount of charge, let's call this delta Q enclosed, that'll pass inside the sphere. And so if we have this free charge Q at the center, the net enclosed charge after this occurs will be Q plus this value, so Q minus that value there. And that's what's got to go into the numerator of Coulomb's law. So after that process occurs, the net enclosed charge is equal to the original free charge minus, well, the negative charge that crosses over NQB squared over K, 4 pi R squared times the electric field E. Now, as always, the electric field is the enclosed charge over 4 pi epsilon 0 R squared. We'll do that on both sides. And that is equal to the electric field E. Notice the electric field now depends on itself. 
So what we need to do is let's break up these two terms over on the left. The first one is just electric field in free space, q over 4 pi epsilon 0 r squared. And the next term, let's see, 4 pi r squared cancels top and bottom. So that's minus n qb squared over k epsilon 0 times the electric field. And that's equal to the electric field. So what do we do now? Move this term to the right. Factor out the electric field E and divide by everything that multiplies E. And we will get that E will be equal to this term on the left, Q over 4 pi epsilon 0 r squared over 1 for this term here. And then this minus becomes a plus when we move it to the right. So plus n q b squared over k epsilon 0. Now we're going to give a name to this n q b squared uh, over k epsilon 0. We're going to call that chi sub e n q b squared over k epsilon 0. So that's just some constant that's characteristic of the material. Depends on this bound charge and the spring constant and the density of, of charges, etc. But it's going to be some number characteristic of the material. And so if we use that definition, then this is 1 plus the chi e. So we can write this as q over 4 pi epsilon 0. Then here, 1 plus chi e r squared. Now, we're going to define the permittivity of the material to be the permittivity of free space times this 1 plus chi e factor. And it can be convenient to define that 1 plus chi e factor as epsilon relative, the relative permittivity. It's dimensionless. It's just 1 plus, this is a dimensionless number. So. Uh, also called the dielectric constant. So we end up with then that the magnitude of the electric field is Q over 4 pi epsilon r squared. Notice that the numerator only contains the free charge. All of the effects of the, all those trillions of trillions of bound charges are accounted for by this epsilon. And so we've basically hidden all of the effects of the bound charges by allowing different materials to, having, to have different values of the permittivity, which is equal to the free space value times the dielectric constant. So if a material has a dielectric constant of 3, it just says its permittivity is 3 times the value of free space. And what that means is that if we put a free charge in that material, the electric field we get at some point will be one-third the strength of what it would be if that char same charge was in free space. It has reduced the electric field by that amount. So in a material, a medium, E is equal to the free charge, so Q now is only the free charge, over 4 pi epsilon r squared. And D, which is epsilon E, well, it just cancels this epsilon factor and leaves Q over 4 pi r squared. So notice that that electric flux density is the same in free space or in the material because the epsilon has canceled out and the epsilon contained all of the effects of those bound charges. So this is the powerful aspect of defining this auxiliary vector in terms of the electric field because the effects of bound charges don't appear in it, just the effects of the free charges. And now when we write 
Gauss's law for the electric field, divergence of D, well, that is equal to Q, and Q is only the density of free charges. We don't have to go through and try to keep track of all the bound charges. So our options are we could either just keep epsilon equal to epsilon zero and keep track of all the bound charges, or we can play this trick of allowing epsilon to be a function of the material, and now we only have to keep track of the free charges. Now what we just did would be true for a static field. You just apply a static electric field and the, the charges separate, and our idea was that we, we'd have this positive and negative bound charges separated by a distance L. This would be plus QB, and this would be minus QB. But now, if we are at a non-zero frequency, we have to look at the frequency dependence of this process, because now the charges have to move back and forth. They separate, and as the electric field right, is going to be the real part of some phasor E, E to the J omega T, well, so 2L will have to be a phasor value, and the actual time value, time dependent value, will be that L times e to the j omega t, the real part. So how do, what does that look like? Well, um, we would have to solve Maxwell's, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Newton's equations. Mass times acceleration is equal to the force. Well, mass times acceleration in this case would be m times the second derivative of displacement, so second derivative of L. Now we could also have a frictional force, loss mechanism, which would, say, be proportional to the velocity, alpha times V, alpha is some constant, uh, friction constant, and that would be alpha times the time derivative of L. And so our equation would look like this. M second derivative of L with respect to time plus alpha, the derivative of L with respect to time, plus the spring force, K times L, would be equal to the applied force. And what's the applied force? Well, it was uh, QB times the electric field. Now this works whether E is the, a real field with some time dependence or whether it's a phasor, in which case L would also have to be a phasor. So we'll assume L T is the real part of L E to the J omega T and E a T is the real part of phasor E, E to the J omega T. So if we go into the phasor domain, remember that a derivative with respect to time is multiplication in the phasor domain by j omega. So the second derivative, well, that's j omega squared. j squared is minus 1, so that becomes minus omega squared m l. And then we have a first derivative. That's just a factor of j omega, so plus j omega alpha l plus KL equals QB times E. And now we can solve for L. Right, we've got a common factor of L here. Factor that out. And then the right-hand side, QBE, is divided by the sum of these three coefficients. K plus J omega alpha minus omega squared M. And we're going to rewrite that as QBE over spring constant K times so here's going to be k times 1, of course, for that term right there. So it'll be k times 1. And then the minus omega squared m, we're going to write that as 
minus omega squared over omega zero squared, where omega zero squared is just k over m. Okay, so k over k over m would be k over k over m would be equal to the m here for the, for this term right there. And then we've got the j omega alpha, which we're going to write as plus j omega over omega d. Where omega d is just our name for k over alpha. So we've factored out this k, and then the omega d has a k to cancel that, and then k over omega d just gets you the, the alpha back. So we write it in this, this form here. So look, notice what happened. In the DC case that we did before, our L was just QBE over K. And now that's the K is multiplied by this complex number right here, which is a function of frequency. Notice this is a function of frequency. When the frequency is equal to the omega zero, which is this resonant frequency, the spring constant over the mass, the denominator gets relatively small and you get a, a strong peak. So all we need to do then is to change our expression, right? Because this is our, our L expression and our chi E was proportional to L. So now we're going to get an expression for the chi E that is frequency dependent. And that's going to look like this. We'll write it as chi E is equal to chi E zero, which will be QBE over K. That is the zero frequency or the DC static value of the electric susceptibility. And then it's divided by this expression in the brackets. This over one minus omega squared over omega zero squared plus j omega over omega d. So with uh, the dielectric constant being equal to one plus chi e, we see that the dielectric constant now becomes a function of frequency and it's in general a complex function of frequency. At omega is equal to omega zero, it's the value we had before, but at higher frequencies, it's going to in general be complex. And with that, um, what we can do usually uh, when you have a complex number in the denominator, you want to make the denominator be a, a real number by multiplying by the complex conjugate of that. So this guy minus j omega over omega d. And if you do that, then you get that chi e is equal to chi e zero times 1 minus omega squared over omega 0 squared minus, that's the conjugate, omega over omega d, and then over the magnitude squared of this expression, which would be 1 minus omega, zero, omega squared over omega 0 squared quantity squared plus omega over omega d squared. So, we get um, a real part and then an imaginary part which has a minus sign. So because of that, right, where epsilon relative is one plus this, and then of course epsilon itself is epsilon zero times epsilon relative, what that means is we're gonna get an epsilon that is complex, has a real part, and the imaginary part is negative. So minus j, we'll call this epsilon double prime. So we'll write, in general, the dielectric uh, constant here times the permittivity of free space gets you your permittivity of the material. It will be a complex permittivity. That's the E sub C just emphasizes that it's complex. It has a real part and an imaginary part that is negative. And they're both functions of frequency. Now we'll see. Uh, actually, we have already seen um, that if the uh, permittivity has a, a negative 
uh, imaginary part that that corresponds to material lossiness and, in a sense, to an effective conductivity. Now, how about permeability? So this is a magnetic effect. And let's just think about, again, with the atomic, very simplistic atomic model. Some atoms effectively have, this is a little charge density, or I'll just draw it as a little current I, little di, say, they have some uh, net circulation of current, either due to the orbital motion of the electrons or the spinning of the electrons. In any case, if you take a current and you make it go around a little loop, you get a magnetic dipole. So let's call this a little magnetic dipole M. And that would create a magnetic field that would go in that direction, at least near the axis of that little charge. So if we have trillions and trillions of these atoms. And they're all just randomly oriented. Oh, let's see, I guess I could go that way. And so they're just thermally m moved around and randomly oriented. And so these little magnetic dipoles don't add up. They tend to all cancel out. So that would be just a system sitting there with no magnetic field applied. Now, if we apply a magnetic field, you solve this problem as an undergraduate. The dipoles tend to want to align with the magnetic field. So now we might have... Still, they're not all perfectly aligned, but they're going to be more or less um, aligned. Maybe something like, like this. Due to the fact that you've applied an external magnetic field. And so over here on the left, without it applied a magnetic field, um, they all basically cancel each other out. Here they, they start to want to align with this magnetic field, and when they do, their own little magnetic fields, their own little uh, magnetization vectors, tend to add up. And we'll call that additional field component M, the magnetization. We will assume that that is proportional to the applied magnetic field, and the constant proportionality we call we'll call chi sub m, the magnetic susceptibility. Now, I should just point out: if you push this magnetization hard enough, what can happen is then that actual magnetization, due to all of these uh, little magnetic dipoles can itself keep them aligned, and then you have a permanent magnet. Even if you then take away the externally applied field, the, the material remains magnetized because now the little dipoles are all reinforcing their direction in space. We're not going to assume that that's the case. That You'd have to generally apply a very, very strong magnetic field for that to be the case. We're talking about relatively weak magnetic fields. So we'll assume that this is a, a linear process. You also know from your power theory uh, courses, when you talk about things like transformers, any any kind of a or machines, anything with a magnetic core, that there's this magnetization process is, can be highly nonlinear, and you can see why that would be. Because once you line up the dipoles, there's no more aligning that is possible. In principle, you can always stretch a spring more and more, but you can't align things more than perfectly aligned. So this magnetization is going to saturate out eventually, and so that's where you. You probably remember in your power courses that if you plot H versus uh, B versus H, the curve would do something like this. And this would be the saturation effect because you'd be lining all these little dipoles up. So with that, we can say that 
our magnetic field inside the material now is H plus M. H is the externally applied field. M is this internal magnetization. And that is going to be 1 plus chi M times H. And then B is mu zero times that total internal magnetic field, H plus M, which is going to be mu zero, 1 plus chi M times H. And we defined that 1 plus chi M to be the relative permeability. It's a dimensionless quantity. And then we define B is just equal to mu H, or mu is mu zero times mu relative. And so that's permeability. Now, it's a little harder to come up with a model like we did for the permittivity for the frequency dependence and lossiness and, and the like. But again, you can imagine that right, if you had a time varying magnetic field, for some of the time it'd be pointing up and then it'd flip down and up and down. And so these little dipoles would have to shift up, down, up, down. And as they do, uh, you can imagine there'd be some frictional effects, collisions between atoms and things. So that in general, mu also could become a complex function of frequency mu prime minus j, mu double prime. And again, the imaginary part would be, would correspond to loss mechanisms. So with that as background, let's just sketch out the different types of media. We'll start off with what we'll call simple media. And these are where epsilon and mu are scalar constants um, at a given frequency. At some omega, given a mega frequency. Now they could be complex, in which case they would be lossy. If they're real, then we have a loss less medium. If one or both are complex, we have a lossy medium. And that's what we're primarily going to be concerned with. So most man-made materials are, at least to a good approximation, simple media. Now we also have dispersive media. This is if epsilon and or mu are functions of frequency omega. So like in our model for the, uh, the little bound charges on the spring, we saw that we got something that was a function of frequency. So if, if the dielectric constant or the relative permeability are functions of frequency, it means, as we'll see, that the different frequency components in a signal that has you know, many different frequency components, because they say it's modulated to carry information, they will behave differently in the material, maybe propagate with a different velocity, for example. And that leads to the problem of dispersion. which will cause a distortion in a, in a signal. So that can be an issue. This is one of the, another reason why it's very useful for us to use this uh, phaser field approach. Because in fact, that means in the time domain, in principle, you cannot say that D is equal to epsilon E because epsilon is a function of frequency. So this is only true at a single frequency omega. So if you have a signal that has many frequency components, this ex simple expression is no longer true. But it is always true in the phasor domain. And we can have homogeneous and inhomogeneous 
oops, media. And that would be media where one or both of these constants are functions of position. So much of uh, natural materials are inhomogeneous. So um, that's one of the complexities in, in defining and describing electromagnetic fields in natural materials. Most man-made materials tend to be homogeneous, or at least piecewise homogeneous. You might have some, we'll talk about this later when we talk about like reflection from planar interfaces. You could have a material that is made up of various layers, but within each of these layers, the epsilon and the mu are constants. Okay, so that is how we would usually attack those kinds of problems where we have different layers or, or different regions of constant uh, epsilon and mu, different simple media in layers. But this would be where, say, the, the variation was continuous, not piecewise constant like this. And then something we will not talk about in this course, but is important in certain applications, anisotropic media. And this is where, so remember, we had this idea of these charges separating by some distance L. Well, for some molecules, especially very comp complex molecule, large molecules, the separation can be easier to achieve in one direction than in another. So say, for a field in the horizontal direction, here we get a relatively large separation. For the same magnitude of field in the vertical direction, we get a much smaller separation. Well, now that permittivity becomes a function of the polarization of the field. And the way that's described is by writing that D is equal to epsilon E, but E now is a matrix. It would have like an E X x and epsilon um, uh, x y and epsilon x z and epsilon y x and so on and likewise the mu could also be a matrix so that's fairly complicated but of course there are some important applications of that one of the most common being the lcd or liquid crystal displays that are used on most tvs and computer monitors uh, that uses the anisotropic behavior of the LCD crystal uh, in order to affect polarization and then a filter is made and that's how you can modulate an image onto an LCD display. We won't talk about isotropic materials in this course and only a little bit about inhomogeneous materials. We will mostly uh, be concerned with simple media. Now, one final type of material is non-linear materials. And you could imagine that this would be a material where, say, D is equal to epsilon times E, but E itself is a function of the strength of the electric field. Or another way to say that, maybe D would be equal to, say, epsilon 1 E, plus epsilon 2e squared, plus it would be some nonlinear function of the electric field. So let's just make this just a magnitude here of d. That would be nonlinear material. And we won't treat nonlinear material in this, in this course. Um, there are certain applications also for that, primarily in nonlinear optics that are kind of interesting, but those are kind of niche uh, applications, especially in the radio frequency analysis, we are primarily concerned with simple media, although dispersion is an important feature of that. And with our us using the phaser domain, we can naturally take care of the dispersion because we're only looking at one frequency at a time. So now let's think about boundary conditions. Uh, so BCs.
So when you have, let's say this is an interface between two materials, uh, here's medium one with mu one epsilon one parameters and medium two with mu two epsilon two parameters. And we wanna know what goes on at that boundary. Because what does it mean to have different mu and epsilon? It means that B is equal to mu H and D is equal to epsilon E. Well, then at this interface, let's say the two electric fields in medium one and medium two are equal, then the electric flux densities cannot be equal because the epsilons are different or vice versa, and likewise for the magnetic fields. So what, are, what is the uh, upshot of all that? So let's sketch this out. Let's call this the surface normal of that boundary, a hat n. And then perpendicular to that will be some tangent vector, a hat t. And now let's imagine a little rectangular loop which uh, bounds some surface and it has a height h and a width w. So let's start off by looking at Faraday's law. The curl of E is equal to minus j omega b, Faraday's law. And the integral form of that is the integral around a loop, e dot dl is equal to minus j omega, the integral around the bounded surface of the magnetic flux, integral b dot ds. So, Let's assume, in this case, we've got that, that uh, H and W are very small. So small that we can consider uh, on this loop and within it that the, the field vectors are, are constants in the two different regions. And let's assume that H goes to zero. So if h goes to zero, the area of this rectangle, this surface here, goes to zero. And so that means that this magnetic flux, if the magnetic flux density is, is finite, and the area goes to zero, well then that has to go to zero. That must mean that in that limit, the integral of e dot dl must be equal to zero. And what would e dot dl be in that case? You get you would get negligible amounts from the vertical sides because that those are going to zero. So down here you would have E2 and up here you'd have E1 tangential. And these would both be the tangential components. And then there would be some other normal component, but the normal component wouldn't contribute to this integral e dot dl around this loop, because it would just be the tangential component there minus the tangential component going there, because you'd integrate this in a right-hand sense. And so this would be equal to e2 tangential times w from the bottom, and then minus, because up here you're going up integrating opposite to the direction of the field, or at least the, the reference direction. So that minus E1 tangential W, and W cancels, and we just get the following result in general, that the tangential components of the field have to be equal. Because you could take this loop and rotate it around 360 degrees, orient it in, in any angle, relative to this, uh, the surface normal. And so for any components of the tangential fields, they'd have to be equal for all orientations. So this is one of the results that must be true at a boundary, that the tangential components of the electric field must be continuous. Now let's think about
Ampere's law, the curl of H is equal to current density J plus J omega D. And we're still looking at this same geometry. Here's the surface normal tangent vector. And we're taking a loop here that has a height H and a width W and bound some rectangular surface there S and we let H go to zero. The integral form of this is the integral around the loop of H dot DL is equal to the integral over the bound surface of J dot DS plus J omega the integral of D dot DS. And if J and D are finite, then that right-hand side goes to zero because the surface area goes to zero. Surface area times the finite number goes to zero. And by the same argument we had for the electric field, this would require that the tangential components are equal. So the tangential component in medium one is equal to the tangential component in medium two. What's the tangential component? Well, just take the field. Remember, E can be broken up as the sum of a normal component and a tangential component, where the normal component is just the normal vector times the dot product of the normal vector and the field itself. And so if you subtract that from the total field, what's left over is the tangential component that's parallel to the surface. So we get that the tangential components of the electric and magnetic field must be continuous across a boundary between two different media. Now, here's that interface. Up here, you've got mu1 epsilon down here, mu2 epsilon2. Here's the surface normal. And now imagine we make a little cylindrical box that pierces through the surface. It has a radius r and a height h. Now we're going to look at, so before we did Ampere and Faraday's law, now we're going to look at the Gauss's law uh, for electric and magnetic fields. So, divergence of D is equal to Q, the charge density, the integral form being that the integral over a closed surface of d dot ds is equal to q enclosed. And so let this be our surface, the surface of that little cylinder. We're going to, again, let h go to 0. So you'll have a little end cap, uh, end cap of area pi r squared, which will be very small, but remain finite. But then the height collapses to 0. And so the enclosed charge would be the charge density times pi r squared h would go to 0, assuming if q is finite, that will be true. Of course, if it was an infinite charge density, then that wouldn't be the case anymore. And if that's so, then what can we say? Well, what is uh, the normal flux on the side of the cylinder? It goes away because h goes to 0. So all we're left with is the flux up there and the flux down on the bottom. And so that's going to be what? Uh, on the top, it's going to be d1 normal pointing upward times pi r squared will be the flux on the top. And then we'll have on the bottom minus d2 normal pi r squared 
that has to go to zero, the pi r squareds cancel, and so we get that d1 normal is equal to d2 normal. I want to write those as vectors, we can't. Well, we get exactly the same result for the magnetic version of Gauss's law, because now there's the right hand side is, is always zero, regardless. Um, and so the same argument would apply. So that we would get B1 normal is equal to B2 normal. So here's the takeaway in words. Tangential components of the electric and magnetic fields are continuous at the boundary. They don't change value as you go across the boundary. And the normal components of the flux densities, D and B, are continuous. across the boundary. And so for finite media, media with finite values of the, the mu and the epsilon, those are our boundary conditions.